us and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in the soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now, for joys laid up above. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. In the darkness of the night, only stars to give me light. I knelt to pray beside the road, giving God the praise I owed. I asked him how it is I stand. Held up by his great loving hand When most of what I've known in life Is brokenness, conflict and strife There on the ground in front of me Lay broken pieces for him to see Each piece a color, all its own All my pain, my loss to him was shown Jesus said he came to heal the brokenhearted You may be one of those brokenhearted this morning Your life in pieces on the ground around you If that's you Give your heart and life to Jesus Christ this morning. Let him pick up those pieces and make something beautiful out of your life. Jesus poured himself for all Over each piece big and small He had just made a work of art 
It was me, my soul and heart. He showed me how he is my hope. My friend, my guide, my king, my light. He gives me peace in place of strife. To him I give my soul, my life. The call comes ringing O'er the restless waves Send the light Send the light There are souls to rescue There are souls to save Send the light Send the light Send the light The blessed gospel light Let it shine From shore to shore Send the light The blessed gospel light Let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost, and when time has surrendered. still cling to the old rugged cross. I believe that this life with its great mysteries surely someday will come to But faith will conquer the darkness and death And will lead me at last to my friend I believe that the Christ who died on the cross has the power to change lives today for he changed me completely a new life is mine That is why by the cross I will stay. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever.
speak on the subject this morning, six reasons why people miss God's plan for their lives. And, and again, you, we have to understand Satan fights us constantly. He's trying to uh, misdirect us so that we don't get to enjoy life that God has planned for us. And so we have a good illustration here of, uh, and we're using in this particular case, uh, Abraham as an illustration to, uh, to see how Satan can get in and mess up God's plan for your life. And he can get into the best people's lives as well as Satan can. Here's Abraham called of God to go out and uh, God says, I'm going to just start following me. I'll, I'll show you where to go and I'm going to make of you a great nation. Um, as a matter of fact, before we look at Genesis 16, look at Genesis 12. This is exactly where God begins with Abram. And he says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless us today. God, help us to <clears throat> enjoy uh, and follow the plan that you have for our lives. It's easy to allow Satan to distract us uh, and, and follow a different course. And yet, Father, you have a wonderful course in life for us. And so uh, guide us and direct us. Might we be alert, vigilant to follow you always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So God makes his promise to Abraham. Your seed's going to be great. And, and, and certainly that is his plan. Uh, and so God, uh, turn on over to uh, chapter 15, which is an interesting portion of Scripture. So uh, Abraham leaves. He's 75 years old, and he starts out following God. And in chapter 15, it says, And after these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, uh, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? He says, uh, Lord, it, it, it's been a long time since you made that promise to me. I still don't have a child. And he goes ahead and says in verse 2, Seeing I go childless, the steward of my house is uh, Eliezer the Damas of Damascus. And Abraham, and Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, the one born in my household is mine heir. And God says in verse 4, uh, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Verse 5, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now up toward heaven. Tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him, uh, to him for righteousness. So once again, God reconfirms this thing. Even though he's waited a while now, still no child. But God said, now just be patient. You know, I've got this plan that I'm working. And boy, it's so, so tough to be patient. Then we come on over to chapter 16. And our text is found in the first five, five verses. And let's look at verse 1. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, bear him no children. Now, that's the problem. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So, I want to talk to you about missing God's plan for your life. We have to be alert to this. Number one, those that miss God's plan, one of the reasons they miss God's plan is they underestimate God's power to do the impossible in their lives. We have to understand, and I'm talking to Christians today for the most part, God, and you know that, God can do the impossible. He can work miracles. The Bible is replete with miracles, even in the Old Testament. He brought water out of a rock. I mean, 
part of the Red Sea, uh, New Testament, Jesus raises the dead, heals the leper, and, and go on, heals the blind. The Lord is a miracle-working God, and we don't want to ever lose sight of that. He still works miracles in your life. He's not here present to where he, you walk up and, and you touch him and touch the hem of his garment and you'll be made whole. No, but he can still perform miracles in your life and believe that. We've got to continue to believe that. And so often what our mistake is that we often look at our situation in life and think there's no way to fix it. Uh, and, and Sarah and Abraham was the same, were in the same condition. She says, look, I've waited here near 10 years, and there's no child. In other words, God isn't keeping his promise. Now, God's keeping his promise. You're just impatient. And boy, it's hard not to become impatient with God. We want something so badly from God. Fix my problem, God. And at first we trust him. Okay, God, I'm going to trust you to fix it. Nothing happens. And nothing happens. This is where Sarah was. Sarah was barren. Now, God had... Told him repeatedly, don't worry, kings and, kings and priests and, are going to come from, from, uh, from you. Um, in a matter of fact, chapter 17, verse 15, 16. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. God is doing everything in his power to tell her, listen, I'm telling you what, you're not going to be able to count the number of people that's going to come from you. But it's hard for her to believe it at that moment. And that's the way it is with us. She's now past childbearing age. Abram's 85 years old. It's been 10 years since God promised to give them a child. And she finally came to the conclusion God, you're just not going to help me, even though God promised her. Now, it's one thing. We have the Bible. It's another thing for God somehow to speak to Abram in a vision and say, here's what I'm going to do for you. I mean, to have God make it that clear. And yet, they still doubted. A little tougher for us today. Because we pray and there's nothing tangible that we can cling to other than the word of God and the promises of God. But I'm sure at the same time you felt frustration in your life. Because nothing's changed and the problem has been going on for a long time. You've been there. We've all been there. God, how long? When are you going to move? The point is, God hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't changed his mind. He's doing something that we can't see in our lives. Or he can be doing it in somebody else's life. But he's always working behind the scenes. The fact that we see no evidence of it does not mean that he's not working at all. And we have to believe that. If you're doing what's right and you're trusting God as we're supposed to, God's working on the problem. You have to understand that. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to keep on praying. You keep on working on your marriage. You keep avoiding bad company that will give you bad suggestions and, and offering a, a, a bad influence on your life. You keep trying to overcome that bad habit in your life so that God, in fact, can bless you. You continue to be a witness for the Lord. Psalm 62, 5 says, My soul, wait thou only on, upon God, for my expectation is from Him. And it's hard, because before long we're looking around for something to fix the problem rather than God. Psalm 123, 2, Behold, as the eyes of the servant looks unto the hand of their masters, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until he have 
had mercy upon us. So, we have, number one, if you're going to get, fulfill God's plan in your life and allow God to do his plan, understand he still is able to work a miracle, even though the problem seems impossible to solve. Number two, they miss God's plan for their lives when they believe that God needs their help to do his work. In verse 2, And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. Now, it gets to the point, and and impatience does this. You know, finally, God, the problem's still there. Somehow, uh, I'm not reading you right, God. Somehow, obviously, you need my help. And so she looks around. Hey, I do have Hagar, my servant. Matter of fact, now that I'm thinking about this, I know what. God's going to do this through Hagar, my servant. Sure. Why didn't I think about that before? No, God's not going to do that. Matter of fact, he doesn't want two wives in that household. (laughs) Abram doesn't want two wives in that household. (laughs) So what happens is she takes matters into her own hands. Now she has God's promise, but that simply is not enough because she hasn't seen the plan work yet. She begins to work on her plan. Now, it's not God's plan. Now, her mind can convince her, just like Eve when she ate of the fruit. Say, well, maybe you're right. Maybe, uh, maybe this will open my eyes. Maybe I will become like God. Maybe I won't really die. Maybe, 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 maybe. And so she eats of it. God needs my help. Somehow, I, I, I've got to get involved in this. She simply became unhappy with God's plan and chose her plan over God's. And yet, we read in the New Testament, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he with hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. The point I'm making is, is God's going to do it his way, okay? It's going to happen just like God said it's going to happen. What happens is we mess it up. We get in, in the middle of this thing. And that's exactly what she did. See, God's always working his plan. And part of his plan is getting us to trust him. Boy, it's hard. And sometimes the only way he can do that is not solve the problem to see how we respond to that. Okay. He didn't solve the problem. And God looks down and says, so, okay, now what's your reaction? Are you still going to trust me? Even though the problem is not solved, even though the prayer request has not been answered, are you still going to trust me when you don't see me at work? Will you trust me till you die? Because I'm God. And see, God looks down. Old Job was tried tremendously. Though he try me, Job says. He said, but I'm going to come through this as gold. Refined, and God did refine Job. Do we trust him? And often the only way God can find that out is to bring us to a point where we're so frustrated and we have a choice to make. Am I going to solve this thing even in an evil way if I have to? Or am I just going to trust you whether I see the answer or not? And once, once we come to that determination in our heart, and God's looking at the heart, ah, you're going to continue to trust me regardless. I like that, God says. Now I will answer it. Now I'll give it to you because you believe in me. And so he may not give us what we want because he's trying... He's, uh, he's testing us to see our trust 
Or sometimes what we want is not part of his plan. He's got a different plan. It's amazing how our plans often don't coincide with God's plan. But I assure you that God doesn't need our help, especially when it leads us into doing something bad. Such as, I'm expecting a check in the mail, it doesn't come. God, please send the check in the mail, it doesn't come, it doesn't come. I guess God wants me to go out and steal. No, he doesn't want you to go out and steal. He doesn't want you to do evil. He doesn't want you to follow Satan to solve the problem. He's still a miracle-working God. Will you trust him even though it becomes desperate? Number three, people miss God's plan for their lives when they cannot wait for God's timing or to adapt to God's timing. Instead, they settle for their own efforts according to their own timing. You see, God has various reasons for making us wait. And often, he's preparing us for what lies ahead. Now, this is what we often can't see. God already sees where you're going to be three years from now, five years from now. He knows the trial you're going to go through five years from now. And he's building you up. He's preparing you. He's strengthening your faith so that you can face that trial. Now, we never see that, and if we don't think about it, we don't even entertain that thought. But this is exactly what God is doing in Abraham's life. He's preparing him for the next trial. Now, had you asked Abraham at that time, he would, he would never have entertained that. He just, here's the struggle. Where's my child? God, you promised me a child is not here. Now I'm 75. Now I'm 85. Now I'm 95. I still don't have a child. God, what are you doing? God says, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is going to impact your life so great. When you have that child at 100 years old, number one, you're going to know that I keep my word. Number two, you're going to know that I can perform miracles. And number three, I'm going to have you face a tougher test than what you have right there. And I'm going to preparing you for it right now. Because if I didn't prepare you here, you'd fail there. See, Isaac is going to be born at age 100. Matter of fact, turn over to page, uh, 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 chapter 21. And the Lord visited this chapter 21 of Genesis, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. God always keeps his word, doesn't he? For Sarah conceived and bare Abram, Abraham a son in his old age. At, notice, at the set time. Now, it was exactly the time God had set. It wasn't the time Abraham and Sarah had set. That's our problem with the timing. God set that time because he had bigger reasons for setting that time. Uh, at the set time of which God has spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham cir circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, and God, as God had commanded. And Abraham was a hundred years old, when his son Isaac was born unto him. And, of course, Sarah, we know, was 90 years old. So it was a miracle child. <clears throat> they tried to do it their way. They messed up. They did give, uh, Sarah did give Hagar to Abraham. And uh, they did have a child by the name of Ishmael. But it's not the one that God wanted them to have. Why the delay? Because God was preparing him for several things. And one, one of them, and the greatest, I believe, was the offering of his son Isaac. So if you go to chapter 22, 
verse 2, God says to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the mount of Moriah, and offer there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee. In other words, I want you to offer now your son. The one I promised, the one that's going to be kings and queens and princes, and you're going to have seed as the stars, I want you to take him up on the mountain and kill him. Offer him as a sacrifice. Lord, you've made me wait all of these years till I'm 100 years old. I finally have him. He's now a, probably a young teenager. And now you're just simply saying, now go kill him? God, I don't understand this. But you never hear Abraham saying that. You see, what happened to... 15 years ago, let's say, Abraham, uh, let's say he was 15 years old at the time, left such an impact upon him. He's going to trust God no matter what now. God did come through. What I couldn't believe he could come through. And so they take him up, and I want to point out to you, in verse 3, and Abraham rose up, chapter 22, verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men uh, with him and, and Isaac, his son. They took wood for a burnt offering, rose up, went unto the place which God told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now notice, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Now notice what he said, and come again to you. Now, God just told him to go sacrifice his son. What would cause Abraham to say, me and the son's coming back? What would cause him to do that? His faith in God. But if he has to kill his son, how in the world could God do this? Glad you asked. Uh, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, because it answers the question. I'm going up there just like God told me, and God told me to kill him, offer him a sacrifice. And yet, I know we're going to come back down out of that mountain. What was Abraham thinking? Tells us. You got Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, speaking of Isaac, he was rejected, for he found no place of rep oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the wrong place here. I'm in chapter 12. Uh, chapter 11, verse 17. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, now see, he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom he, it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God is able to raise him up, even from the dead. I'm saying to you that Abraham really believed that he was going to kill his son and God was going to raise him up. He had that kind of faith in God. How did he get it? Because he passed the test back here with Isaac being born when he would have said, I am dead. There's no way I could have a son at 100 years old. He said, when God can produce a seed at 100 years old and I can bring forth such a son, <laughs> it's no problem for God to raise my son back to life. I'm saying to you, this is the kind of a God we serve. I'm telling you what, Satan is going to try all of us. We're living in dangerous days right now as far as America is concerned. Satan is coming after America. He's shooting for the overthrow of America. 
But I'm still saying to you, if God wants to bless America, he can bless and he'll defeat Satan and Satan's host and Satan's crowd. God's people has to have faith and trust him because God's very able to succeed in anything that he wants to succeed in. Satan is a roaring lion. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. God tells us to be vigilant, and we must be. God has a plan to fulfill. Satan will try to get us off of our plan, try to do it a carnal way of some way, try to solve the problem. God simply says, trust me. And I think I've mentioned that on September, the I think it's the 27th, last Sunday of September, there's going to be a great rally in Washington where tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are going to go there. Why? For God and country, turning back to God and asking God to bless America. And I guarantee you to God, that's a sweet savor. Of, it's an incense coming up as people, his people pray and look to God for the solution. Our expectation is from you. That's how we solve our problems. We don't have to burn down a city. You go to God. God's still able to do miracles, even when it looks like it's all over. Thank God for the Christian. The one that the world hates so much, the born-again believer, we are the, we are the solution to the problem. It's just like Jesus... When he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That crowd out there don't realize what they're doing. Now, they think they do. They think, oh, we'll just make a better world. No, you're not. You're going to ruin the world, and you're going to hate it afterwards. Let's just trust God that God will keep blessing America. Number four, we miss God's plan when we let somebody else talk us into doing something that we know we should not do. Verse 12, Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. It's not to put too much blame on Hera, uh, Sarah. <clears throat> he, Abraham simply hearkened to her voice. Sarah said, hey, Abraham, it's not going to happen. Here's Hagar. Take her for a wife. Now, we can blame Sarah, but ultimately it's up to Abraham. <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll take a, I'll take a, uh, Hagar. Silly man, you should never have done that. But so often we're so easily influenced to do wrong, whether it's in, even in our family or elsewhere. Matter of fact, we have to be careful of the influences in our lives or it will distract us from God's great plan for your life. It's not uncommon at all for people to say, you don't need to go to services today. I'm sure most of you have had that said at some point in your life. You said, well, I'm going to go to church. Oh, you don't need to. <clears throat> Always that influence out there discouraging you from doing what God would like for you to do. We have to deal with it all the time. Uh, people say it's okay to live together outside of holy matrimony. Who are you listening to? You're certainly not listening to God. God says abstain from fornication. Matter of fact, when you look at the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, adultery and fornication are two of the greatest works of the flesh. They're there. It's of evil. It's not of God. And yet, it makes no difference because society puts its stamp of approval on, on sin. And people buy into it and say, I guess it's okay. No, it's not okay. You're missing God's great plan for your life. Why throw that away? Well, God understands. Well, he doesn't understand that. He understands we're sinners, but he doesn't understand why you would serve Satan when you can, in fact, serve God. He doesn't understand that. But we always excuse it, don't we? I can't tithe. I got too many bills. Well, the reason you got too many bills is because you don't tithe. <laughs> it's just the way it works. Get your priorities in line. I ain't gonna go out and buy me a new sofa. Can you afford it? Or are you gonna use God's money? Oh, 
See, you ruin everything, preacher. <laughs> Influences are powerful. Somebody's always influencing. Number Number five, be careful of the influences, the wrong influences in your life. Number five, uh, we miss God's plan in our lives when I go ahead with my actions with, without any regard or any thought of the consequences. <clears throat> People do that all the time. I, lo- I watch these protests and riots. I, you know, again, it, it wearies me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Get out of my face then. Because I am going to touch you. If you step, a, I'm a policeman. You take another step closer to me. I am going to touch you. Oh, don't touch me. Don't touch me. And yet they feel like they can police, push the policeman, don't they? They think they can bomb the building. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. They don't want, no one wants to take responsibility for their actions. Why? Because when I do bad, there is a consequence to it. Well, I want to be able to do bad, they say, and I don't want any consequences. Tough. There are consequences. And I guarantee you this, unbeliever, when you stand before God, God is going to have, the Bible simply says, the angels will take you and cast you into hell. You're not going to get any mercy. There's no love in hell. There is a consequences to your actions today, and it is an eternal destiny and a lake of fire. Whether you like it, you cannot change that. That's part of destiny. It's already been written. And you may get out of a lot of stuff today, but I guarantee you when you stand before God, it's, you will get justice on that day, and justice will be the consequences for your actions. I'm glad I live today when there's mercy and grace. Amen? And I'm not ashamed at all. They want to bow. I'll bow right here before my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who I bow before. But boy, the world has its influences, doesn't it? Influencing everybody to follow Satan and Satan's plan. I'm saying to you that there's consequences. Abraham takes Hagar with no thought of how it's going to destroy their family. Matter of fact, if we continue to read back there in chapter 16, as soon as Ishmael was born, Hagar looked at Sarah totally different. She no longer respected Sarah. There was division in the home. Sarah says, get, get out of my house, Hagar, and Hagar had to leave. It totally upset the home, and that's what Satan does. He's, he's after destruction. Sarah made a poor decision. Abraham made a poor decision. And poor decisions frustrate God's plan for you and for me. As I said earlier, stay with God's word. Stay with God's plan. You can't improve upon it. Just obey God and what he wants in your life. And lastly, we miss God's plan when I have to blame somebody else for my failure. We hear a lot of that today, don't we? I'm a victim. I'm just a victim. Everybody's picking on me. Abraham, what have you done? Uh, It was Sarah. It was Sarah. She told me, Abraham, honey, there's Hagar. Why don't you take her to be your wife? Yeah. She didn't make you. Well, Abraham says, "Um, it was Satan. Boy, we're just excellent at passing the buck. You know, none of us want to take responsibility for our wrong choices. And it goes all the way back in time. Nothing changes. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and so on. You know how it goes. God's faithful to his plan even when we're not. You just cannot go wrong when you just stay with the word of God. God, this is, my, this is you speaking to me today. You don't come to me in a vision like you did Abraham and 
Uh, an angel doesn't appear to me like Gabriel did to Mary. You talk to me through your word, and you speak to my heart through prayer. And as long as I talk to you in prayer and it coincides, coincides with the word of God, that's what I'm going to do. And Lord, if I don't see the answer, God, I'm just going to wait on you. I'm not going to try to interfere. I'm not going to try to get ahead of you. I'm not going to try to do something evil to make it turn out good. God, I just want to do what you want to do with my life. And I tell you what, if we will submit to God's plan, you will have, in fact, the best life that God can give you. But we often are the problem. We get too too embroiled in in the problem. We want the answer so quickly, and we want it done our way. And so God is faithful. He gives them Isaac, and the Jewish people have, pop, have, have spread and populated, and, and certainly uh, over the course of thousands of years, God ex- did exactly, exactly what he promised all the way back in Genesis through the seed of Isaac, and God fulfilled his part of the plan. First Thessalonians 5, 24, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God is the one who's faithful. We often let him down, don't we? We often fail him. We get impatient. We get angry. We, we make so many mistakes. And it always costs us in some way, you know. And God says, you could avoid all of that if you just trust me. Because I am faithful. I'm going to fulfill my plan in your life. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God's faithful. By whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, if God's word says it, we just believe it. Just trust him. So what should I do when God's not answering my prayers? or I don't see the answer that I'm expecting, do as Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, I don't care. I've already made up my mind. I've set my heart. I've set my course. I'm going to trust God regardless of whether he solves the problem or not. I'm just going to continue to serve him, live for him, love him, do the things that he wants me to do according to his word. I'm just going to, I I have that kind of trust in him. And then David concludes by saying in Psalm 37, 5, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He will solve your problem in some way. It may not be the way you anticipated But he is the problem solver. Stand with me, please. I'll stay in the